Preface to Chapter Five of Einhard's Life of Charlemagne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Einhard's Life of Charlemagne. Preface to Chapter Five. Einhard's Preface. Since I have taken upon myself to narrate the public and private life. And no small part of the deeds of my lord and foster father, the most lent and most justly renowned King Charles, I have condensed the matter into as brief a form as possible. I have been careful not to omit any facts that could come to my knowledge, but at the same time not to offend by a prolix style those minds that despise everything modern, if one can possibly avoid offending by a new work men who seem to despise also the masterpieces of antiquity. The works of most learned and luminous writers. Very many of them, I have no doubt, are men devoted to a life of literary leisure, who feel that the affairs of the present generation ought not to be passed by, and who do not consider everything done to day as unworthy of mention, and deserving to be given over to silence and oblivion, but are nevertheless seduced by lust of immortality to celebrate the glorious deeds of other times by some sort of composition. Rather than to deprive posterity of the mention of their own names by not writing at all. Be this as it may, I see no reason why I should refrain from entering upon a task of this kind, since no man can write with more accuracy than I of events that took place about me, and of facts concerning which I had personal knowledge, ocular demonstration, as the saying goes, and I have no means of ascertaining whether or not any one else has the subject in hand. In any event, I would rather commit my story to writing, and hand it down to posterity in partnership with others, so to speak, than to suffer the most glorious life of this most excellent king, the greatest of all the princes of his day, and his illustrious deeds, hard for men of later times to imitate, to be wrapped in the darkness of oblivion. But there are still other reasons, neither unwarrantable nor insufficient, in my opinion, that urge me to write on this subject. Namely, the care that King Charles bestowed upon me in my childhood, and my constant friendship with himself and his children after I took up my abode at court. In this way, he strongly endeared me to himself, and made me greatly his debtor as well in death as in life, so that, were I unmindful of the benefits conferred upon me, to keep silence concerning the most glorious and illustrious deeds of a man who claims so much at my hands. And suffer his life to lack due eulogy and written memorial, as if he had never lived, I should deservedly appear ungrateful, and be so considered, albeit my powers are feeble, scanty, next to nothing indeed, and not at all adapted to write and set forth a life that would tax the eloquence of a Tully. Note, Tully is Marcus Tullius Cicero. I submit the book. It contains the history of a very great and distinguished man. But there is nothing in it to wonder at besides his deeds, except the fact that I, who am a barbarian and very little versed in the Roman language, seem to suppose myself capable of writing gracefully and respectably in Latin, and to carry my presumption so far as to disdain the sentiment that Cicero is said in the first book of the Tusculan Disputations to have expressed when speaking of the Latin authors. His words are. It is an outrageous abuse both of time and literature for a man to commit his thoughts to writing without having the ability either to arrange them or elucidate them or attract readers by some charm of style. This dictum of the famous orator might have deterred me from writing if I had not made up my mind that it was better to risk the opinions of the world and put my little talents for composition to the test than to slight the memory of so great a man for the sake of sparing myself. The Life of the Emperor Charles. Chapter I. The Merovingian Family. The Merovingian family, from which the Franks used to choose their kings, is commonly said to have lasted until the time of Childeric the Third, seven forty three to seven fifty two, who was deposed, shaved, and thrust into the cloister by command of the Roman Pontiff Stephen, the Second or Third, seven fifty two to seven fifty seven. But although, to all outward appearance, it ended with him, it had long since been devoid of vital strength, and conspicuous only from bearing the empty epithet royal. 
the real power and authority in the kingdom lay in the hands of the chief officer of the court, the so-called mayor of the palace, and he was at the head of affairs. There was nothing left the king to do but to be content with his name of king, his flowing hair and long beard, to sit on his throne and play the ruler, to give ear to the ambassadors that came from all quarters, and to dismiss them, as if on his own responsibility, in words that were, in fact, suggested to him, or even imposed upon him. He had nothing that he could call his own beyond this vain title of king, and the precarious support allowed by the mayor of the palace in his discretion, except at a single country seat, that brought him but a very small income. There was a dwelling-house upon this, and a small number of servants attached to it, sufficient to perform the necessary offices. When he had to go abroad, he used to ride in a cart, drawn by a yoke of oxen, driven, peasant-fashion, by a ploughman. He rode in this way to the palace, and to the general assembly of the people, that met once a year for the welfare of the kingdom, and he returned him in like manner. The mayor of the palace took charge of the government, and of everything that had to be planned or executed at home or abroad. CHAPTER Two, CHARLEMAGNE'S ANCESTORS At the time of Childeric's deposition, Pepin, the father of King Charles, held this office of mayor of the palace, one might almost say, by hereditary right. For Pepin's father, Charles Martel, 1715-1741, had received it at the hands of his father, Pepin, and filled it with distinction. It was this Charles that crushed the tyrants who claimed to rule the whole Frank land as their own, and that utterly routed the Saracens when they attempted the conquest of Gaul, in two great battles, one in Aquitania, near the town of Poitiers, and the other on the river Ber, near Narbonne, and compelled them to return to Spain. This honor was usually conferred by the people only upon men eminent from their illustrious birth and ample wealth. For some years, ostensibly under King, the father of King Charles, Childeric, Pepin shared the duties inherited from his father and grandfather most amicably with his brother, Carloman. The latter, then, for reasons unknown, renounced the heavy cares of an earthly crown and retired to Rome, 747. Here he exchanged his worldly garb for a cowl, and built a monastery on Mount Orest, near the church of St. Sylvester, where he enjoyed for several years the seclusion that he desired, in company with certain others who had the same object in view. But so many distinguished Franks made the pilgrimage to Rome to fulfill their vows, and insisted upon paying their respects to him as their former lord on the way, that the repose which he so much loved was broken by these frequent visits, and he was driven to change his abode. Accordingly, when he found that his plans were frustrated by his many visitors, he abandoned the mountain and withdrew to the monastery of St. Benedict, on Monte Cassino, in the province of Samnium, in 754, and passed the rest there in the exercise of religion. CHAPTER Three, CHARLEMAGNE'S ACCESSION Pepin, however, was raised by decree of the Roman pontiff, from the rank of mayor of the palace to that of king, and ruled alone over the Franks for fifteen years or more, 752 to 768. He died of dropsy, September 24, 768, in Paris at the close of the Aquitanian War, which he had waged with William, Duke of Aquitania, for nine successive years, and left his two sons, Charles and Carloman, upon whom, by the grace of God, the secession devolved. The Franks, in general assembly of the people, made them both kings, October 9, 786, on condition that they should divide the whole kingdom equally between them, Charles to take and rule the part that had belonged to their father, Pepin, and Carloman the part which their uncle, Carloman, had governed. The conditions were accepted, and each entered into the possession of the share of the kingdom that fell to him by this arrangement, but peace was only maintained between them with the greatest difficulty, because many of Carloman's party kept trying to disturb their good understanding, and there were some even to plotted to involve them in a war with each other. The event, however, which showed the danger to have been rather imaginary than real, for at Carloman's death his widow, Gerberga, fled to Italy with her sons and her principal inheritance, and without reason, despite her husband's brother, put herself and her children under the protection of Desiderius, king of the Lombards. Carloman had succumbed to disease after ruling two years, 
in fact, more than three, in common with his brother, and at his death Charles was unanimously elected king of the Franks. CHAPTER Four, PLAN OF THIS WORK it would be folly, I think, to write a word concerning Charles's birth and infancy, or even his boyhood, for nothing has ever been written on the subject, and there is no one alive now who can give information on it. Accordingly, I determined to pass that by as unknown, and to proceed at once to treat of his character, his deed, and such other facts of his life as are worth telling and setting forth, and shall give first an account of his deed at home and abroad, then of his character and pursuits, and lastly of his administration and death, omitting nothing worth knowing or necessary to know. CHAPTER V. AQUITANIAN WAR His first undertaking in a military way was the Aquitanian War, begun by his father, but not brought to a close, and because he thought that it could be readily carried through, he took it up while his brother was yet alive, calling upon him to render aid. The campaign once opened, he conducted it with the greatest vigor, notwithstanding his brother withheld the assistance that he had promised, and did not desist or shrink from his self-imposed task until, by his patience and firmness, he had completely gained his ends. He compelled Hunold, who had attempted to seize Aquitania after Wayfar's death, and to renew the war then almost concluded, to abandon Aquitania and flee to Gascony. Even here he gave him no rest, but crossed the river Garonne, built the castle of Fronsac, and sent ambassadors to Lupus, Duke of Gascony, to demand the surrender of the fugitive, threatening to take him by force unless he were promptly given up to him. Therefore Lupus chose the wiser course, and not only gave Hunold up, but submitted himself, with the province which he ruled, to the king. End of Preface through Chapter 5《ラフトゥイナーシュタイナーシュタイナーシュタイナーシュタイナーシュタイナーシュタイナーシュタイナーシュタイナーシュタイナーシュタイナーシュタイナーシュタイナーシュタイナーシュタイナーシュタイナーシュタイナーシュタイナーシュタ After bringing this war to an end, and settling matters in Aquitania, his associate in authority had meantime departed this life, he was induced, in 773, by the prayers and entreaties of Hadrian I, 772 to 795, bishop of the city of Rome, to wage war on the Lombards. His father before him had undertaken this task at the request of Pope Stephen, the second or third, 752 to 757. But under great difficulties, for certain leading Franks, of whom he usually took counsel, had so vehemently opposed his design as to declare openly that they would leave the king and go home. Nevertheless, the war against the Lombard king Astolf had been taken up and very quickly concluded. 754. Now, although Charles seems to have had similar, or rather just the same, grounds for declaring war that his father had, the war itself differed from the preceding one alike in its difficulties and its issue. Pepin, to be sure, after besieging King Astolf a few days in Pavia, had compelled him to give hostages, to restore to the Romans the cities and castles that he had taken, and to make oath that he would not attempt to seize them again. But Charles did not cease, after declaring war, until he had exhausted King Desiderius by a long siege, 773, and forced him to surrender at discretion, driven his son Adalgus, the last hope of the Lombards, not only from his kingdom, but from all Italy, 774, restored to the Romans all that they had lost, subdued Hradgaus, Duke of Freely, 776, Who was plotting revolution, reduced all Italy to his power, and set his son Pepin as king over it. 781. At this point I should describe Charles's difficult passage over the Alps into Italy, and the hardships that the Franks endured in climbing the trackless mountain ridges, the heaven aspiring cliffs, and ragged peaks, if it were not my purpose in this work to record the manner of his life rather than the incidents of the wars that he waged. 
suffice it to say that this war ended with the subjection of Italy, the banishment of King Desiderius for life, the expulsion of his son Adalgis from Italy, and the restoration of the conquests of the Lombard kings to Hadrian, the head of the Roman Church. CHAPTER Seven, SAXON WAR At the conclusion of this struggle, the Saxon war, that seems to have been only laid aside for the time, was taken up again. No war ever undertaken by the Frank nation was carried on with such persistence and bitterness, or cost so much labour, because the Saxons, like almost all the tribes of Germany, were a fierce people, given to the worship of devils and hostile to our religion, and did not consider it dishonourable to transgress and violate all law, human and divine. Then there were peculiar circumstances that tended to cause a breach of peace every day. Except in a few places where large forests or mountain ridges intervened, and made the bounds certain, the line between ourselves and the Saxons passed almost in its whole extent through an open country, so that there was no end to the murders, thefts, and arsons on both sides. In this way the Franks became so embittered that they at last resolved to make reprisals no longer, but to come to open war with the Saxons. 772. Accordingly war was begun against them, and was waged for thirty-three successive years with great fury, more, however, to the disadvantage of the Saxons than of the Franks. It could doubtless have been brought to an end sooner, had it not been for the faithlessness of the Saxons. It is hard to say how often they were conquered, and, humbly submitting to the king, promised to do what was enjoined upon them, without hesitation the required hostages, gave and received the officers sent them from the king. They were sometimes so much weakened and reduced that they promised to renounce the worship of devils, and to adopt Christianity, but they were no less ready to violate these terms than prompt to accept them, so that it is impossible to tell which came easier to them to do. Scarcely a year passed from the beginning of the war without such changes on their part. But the king did not suffer his high purpose and steadfastness, firm alike in good and evil fortune, to be wearied by any fickleness on their part, or to be turned from the task that he had undertaken. On the contrary, he never allowed their faithless behaviour to go unpunished, but either took the field against them in person, or sent his counts with an army to wreak vengeance and exact righteous satisfaction. At last, after conquering and subduing all who had offered resistance, he took ten thousand of those that lived on the banks of the Elbe, and settled them, with their wives and children, in many different bodies here and there in Gaul and Germany. 804. The war that had lasted so many years was at length ended by their acceding to the terms offered by the king, which were renunciation of their national religious customs and the worship of devils, acceptance of the sacraments of the Christian faith and religion, and union with the Franks to form one people. CHAPTER Eight. SAXON WAR CONTINUED Charles himself fought but two pitched battles in this war, although it was long protracted one on Mount Osning, 783, at the place called Detmold, and again on the bank of the river Hase, both in the space of little more than a month. The enemy were so routed and overthrown in these two battles that they never afterwards ventured to take the offensive, or to resist the attacks of the king, unless they were protected by a strong position. A great many of the Frank, as well as of the Saxon nobility, men occupying the highest posts of honour, perished in this war, which only came to an end after the lapse of thirty-two years. 804. So many and grievous were the wars that were declared against the Franks in the meantime, and skilfully conducted by the king, that one may reasonably question whether his fortitude or his good fortune is to be more admired. The Saxon war began two years, 772, before the Italian war, 773, but although it went on without interruption, business elsewhere was not neglected, nor was there any shrinking from other equally arduous contests. The king, who excelled all the princes of his time in wisdom and greatness of soul, did not suffer difficulty to deter him or danger to daunt him from anything that had to be taken up or carried through, for he had trained himself to bear and endure whatever came, without yielding in adversity or trusting to the deceitful favours of fortune in prosperity. 
Chapter Nine, Spanish Expedition. In the midst of this vigorous and almost uninterrupted struggle with the Saxons, he covered the frontier by garrisons at the proper points and marched over the Pyrenees into Spain at the head of all the forces that he could muster. All the towns and castles that he attacked surrendered, and up to the time of his homeward march he sustained no loss whatever. But on his return through the Pyrenees, he had cause to rue the treachery of the Gascons. That region is well adapted for ambuscades by reason of the thick forests that cover it, and as the army was advancing in the long line of march necessitated by the narrowness of the road, the Gascons, who lay in ambush, 778, on the top of a very high mountain, attacked the rear of the baggage train and the rear guard in charge of it, and hurled them down to the very bottom of the valley, at Roncesvalles, later celebrated in the Song of Roland. In the struggle that ensued, they cut them off to a man. Then they plundered the baggage and dispersed with all speed in every direction under cover of approaching night. The lightness of their armor and the nature of the battle ground stood the Gascons in good stead on this occasion, whereas the Franks fought at a disadvantage in every respect because of the weight of their armor and the unevenness of the ground. Egihard, the king's steward, Anselm, Count Palatine, and Roland, governor of the March of Brittany, with very many others, fell in this engagement. This ill turn could not be avenged for the nonce, because the enemy scattered so widely after carrying out their plan that not the least clue could be had to their whereabouts. Chapter Ten, Submission of the Bretons and Beneventans. Charles also subdued the Bretons. 786, who live on the sea coast in the extreme western part of Gaul. When they refused to obey him, he sent an army against them and compelled them to give hostages and to promise to do his bidding. He afterwards entered Italy in person with his army, 787, and passed through Rome to Capua, a city in Campania, where he pitched his camp and threatened the Beneventans with hostilities unless they should submit themselves to him. Their duke, Aragus, escaped the danger by sending his two sons, Rumold and Grimold, with a great sum of money to meet the king, begging him to accept them as hostages, and promising for himself and his people compliance with all the king's commands, on the single condition that his personal attendance should not be required. The king took the welfare of the people into account rather than the stubborn disposition of the duke, accepted the proffered hostages, and released him from the obligation to appear before him in consideration of his handsome gift. He retained the younger son only as hostage, and sent the elder back to his father, and returned to Rome, leaving commissioners with Aragus to extract the oath of allegiance, and administer it to the Beneventans. He stayed in Rome several days, in order to pay his devotions at the holy places, and then came back to Gaul. 787 Chapter Eleven, Tassilo and the Bavarian Campaign. At this time, on a sudden, the Bavarian War broke out, but came to a speedy end. It was due to the arrogance and folly of Duke Tassilo. His wife, Luitberga, a daughter of King Desiderius, was desirous of avenging her father's banishment through the agency of her husband, and accordingly induced him to make a treaty with the Huns the neighbours of the Bavarians on the east, and not only to leave the king's commands unfulfilled, but to challenge him to war. Charles's high spirit could not brook Tassilo's insubordination, for it seemed to him to pass all bounds. Accordingly he straightway summoned his troops from all sides for a campaign against Bavaria, and appeared in person with a great army on the river Lech, which forms the boundary between the Bavarians and the Alemanni. After pitching his camp upon its banks, he determined to put the duke's disposition to the test, by an embassy, before entering the province. Tassilo did not think that it was for his own or his people's good to persist, so he surrendered himself to the king, gave the hostages demanded, among them his own son Theodo, and promised by oath not to give ear to any one who should attempt to turn him from his allegiance. So this war, which bade fair to be very grievous, came very quickly to an end. 
Tassilo, however, was afterward summoned to the king's presence, 788, and not suffered to depart, and the government of the province that he had had in charge was no longer entrusted to a duke, but to counts. Chapter 12. Slavic War. After these uprisings had been thus quelled, war was declared against the Slavs, who are commonly known among us as Vilci, but properly, that is to say in their own tongue, are called Wellatabians. The Saxons served in this campaign as auxiliaries among the tribes that followed the king's standard at his summons, but their obedience lacked sincerity and devotion. War was declared because the Slavs kept harassing the Abodriti, old allies of the Franks, by continual raids, in spite of all commands to the contrary. A gulf, i.e. the Baltic Sea, of unknown length, was nowhere more than a hundred miles wide, and in many parts narrower, stretches off towards the east from the western ocean. Many tribes have settlements on its shores, the Danes and Swedes, whom we call Northmen, on the northern shore and all the adjacent islands, but the southern shore is inhabited by the Slava and the Aesti, from whom derive the modern name of Estonia, and various other tribes. The Wellatabians, against whom the king now made war, were the chief of these, but in a single campaign, 789, which he conducted in person, he so crushed and subdued them, that they did not think it advisable thereafter to refuse obedience to his commands. Chapter 13. War with the Huns. The war against the Avars, or Huns, followed, 791, and, except the Saxon war, was the greatest that he waged. He took it up with more spirit than any of his other wars, and made far greater preparations for it. He conducted one campaign in person in Pannonia, of which the Huns then had possession. He entrusted all subsequent operations to his son, Pepin, and the governors of the provinces, to counts even, and lieutenants. Although they most vigorously prosecuted the war, it only came to a conclusion after seven years' struggle. The utter depopulation of Pannonia, and the site of the Khan's palace, now a desert, where not a trace of human habitation is visible, bear witness how many battles were fought in those years, and how much blood was shed. The entire body of the Hun nobility perished in this contest, and all its glory with it. All the money and treasure that had been years amassing was seized, and no war in which the Franks have ever engaged within the memory of man brought them such riches and such booty. Up to that time the Huns had passed for a poor people, but so much gold and silver was found in the Khan's palace, and so much valuable spoil taken in battle, that one may well think that the Franks took justly from the Huns what the Huns had formerly taken unjustly from other nations. Only two of the chief men of the Franks fell in this war. Eric, Duke of Fruili, who was killed in Tarsach, 799, a town on the coast of Liburnia, by the treachery of the inhabitants, and Gerald, governor of Bavaria, who met his death in Pannonia, slain, 799, with two men that were accompanying him, by an unknown hand while he was marshalling his forces for battle against the Huns, and riding up and down the line encouraging his men. This war was otherwise almost a bloodless one, so far as the Franks were concerned, and ended most satisfactorily, although by reason of its magnitude it was long protracted. End of section two. Read by Kara Schallenberg on October sixteenth, two thousand seven, in Oceanside, California. Chapters fourteen to twenty one of Einhardt's Life of Charlemagne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Einhardt's Life of Charlemagne, Chapters 14 to 21. 14. The Danish War. The Saxon War next came to an end as successful as the struggle had been long. The Bohemian War, 
805 to 806, and the Linonian War, 808, that next broke out, could not last long. Both were quickly carried through under the leadership of the younger Charles. The last of these wars was the one declared against the Northmen called Danes. They began their career as pirates, but afterwards took to laying waste the coasts of Gaul and Germany with their large fleet. Their King Godfred was so puffed with vain aspirations that he counted on gaining empire over all Germany, and looked upon Saxony and Frisia as his provinces. He had already subdued his neighbours the Abodriti, and made them tributary, and boasted that he would shortly appear with a great army before Aix la chapelle Arken, Charlemagne's capital, where the king held his court. Some faith was put in his words, empty as they sound, and it is supposed that he would have attempted something of the sort if he had not been prevented by a premature death. He was murdered, in 810, by one of his own bodyguard, and so ended at once his life and the war that he had begun. 15. The Extent of Charlemagne's Conquests Such are the wars, most skilfully planned and successfully fought, which this most powerful king waged during the forty-seven years of his reign. He so largely increased the Frank kingdom, which was already great and strong when he received it at his father's hands, that more than double its former territory was added to it. The authority of the Franks was formerly confined to that part of Gaul included between the Rhine and the Loire, the ocean and the Balearic Sea, to that part of Germany which is inhabited by the so-called eastern Franks, and is bounded by Saxony and the Danube, the Rhine and the Zala. This stream separates the Thuringians from the Sorabians, and to the country of the Alemanni and Bavarians. By the wars above mentioned he first made tributary Aquitania, Gascony, and the whole of the region of the Pyrenees as far as the river Ebro, which rises in the land of the Navarres, flows through the most fertile districts of Spain, and empties into the Balearic Sea, beneath the walls of the city of Tortosa. He next reduced and made tributary all Italy, from Aosta to Lower Calabria, where the boundary line runs between the Beneventans and the Greeks, a territory more than a thousand miles long. Then Saxony, which constitutes no small part of Germany, and is reckoned to be twice as wide as the country inhabited by the Franks, while about equal to it in length. In addition, both Pannonias, Dacia beyond the Danube, and Istria, Liburnia, and Dalmatia, except the cities on the coast, which he left to the Greek emperor for friendship's sake, and because of the treaty that he had made with him. In fine, he vanquished and made tributary all the wild and barbarous tribes dwelling in Germany between the Rhine and the Vistula, the Ocean and the Danube all of which speak very much the same language, but differ widely from one another in customs and dress. The chief among them are the Welatabians, the Sorabians, the Abudriti, and the Bohemians, and he had to make war upon these, but the rest, by far the larger number, submitted to him of their own accord. 16. Foreign Relations He added to the glory of his reign, by gaining the good will of several kings and nations. So close, indeed, was the alliance that he contracted with Alfonso the second, 791-842, king of Galicia and Asturias, that the latter, when sending letters or ambassadors to Charles, invariably styled himself his man. His munificence won the kings of the Scots also to pay such deference to his wishes, that they never gave him any other title than lord, or themselves than subjects and slaves. There are letters from them extant, in which these feelings in his regard are expressed. His relations with Aaron, i.e. Harun al-Rashid, 786-809, king of the Persians, who ruled over almost the whole of the East, India excepted, were so friendly that this prince preferred his favour to that of all the kings and potentates of the earth, and considered that to him alone marks of honour and munificence were due. 
Accordingly, when the ambassadors sent by Charles to visit the most holy sepulchre and place of resurrection of our Lord and Saviour, presented themselves before him with gifts, and made known their master's wishes, he not only granted what was asked, but gave possession of that holy and blessed spot. When they returned, he dispatched his ambassadors with them, and sent magnificent gifts, besides stuffs, perfumes, and other rich products of eastern lands. A few years before this, Charles had asked him for an elephant, and he sent the only one that he had. The emperors of Constantinople, Nicephorus the first, eight o two to eight eleven, Michael the first, eight eleven to eight one three, and Leo the fifth, eight thirteen to eight twenty made advances to Charles, and sought friendship and alliance with him by several embassies. And even when the Greeks suspected him of designing to wrest the empire from them, because of his assumption of the title emperor, they made a close alliance with him, that he might have no cause of offence. In fact, the power of the Franks was always viewed by the Greeks and Romans with a jealous eye, whence the Greek proverb, Have the Frank for your friend, but not for your neighbour. 17. Public Works This king, who showed himself so great in extending his empire and subduing foreign nations, and was constantly occupied with plans to that end, undertook also very many works calculated to adorn and benefit his kingdom, and brought several of them to completion. Among these, the most deserving of mention, are the Basilica of the Holy Mother of God at Aix la Chapelle, built in the most admirable manner, and a bridge over the Rhine at Mayence, half a mile long, the breadth of the river at this point. This bridge was destroyed by fire, May 813, the year before Charles died, but owing to his death soon after, could not be repaired, although he had intended to rebuild it in stone. He began two palaces of beautiful workmanship, one near his manor called Ingelheim, not far from Mayence, the other at Nimagen on the Val, the stream that washes the south side of the island of the Batavians. But, above all, sacred edifices were the object of his care throughout his whole kingdom, and whenever he found them falling to ruin from age, he commanded the priests and fathers who had charge of them to repair them, and made sure by commissioners that his instructions were obeyed. He also fitted out a fleet for the war with the Northmen. The vessels required for this purpose were built on the rivers that flow from Gaul and Germany into the northern ocean. Moreover, since the Northmen continually overran and laid waste the Gallic and German coasts, he caused watch and ward to be kept in all the harbours, and at the mouths of rivers large enough to admit the entrance of vessels, to prevent the enemy from disembarking and in the south, in Narbonensis and Septimania, and along the whole coast of Italy, as far as Rome, he took the same precautions against the Moors, who had recently begun their piratical practices. Hence Italy suffered no great harm in his time at the hands of the Moors, nor Gaul and Germany from the Northmen, save that the Moors got possession of the Etruscan town of Civita Vecchia by treachery, and sacked it, and the Northmen harried some of the islands of Frisia off the German coast. 18. Private Life Thus did Charles defend and increase, as well as beautify, his kingdom, as is well known. And here let me express my admiration of his great qualities and his extraordinary constancy alike in good and evil fortune. I will now forthwith proceed to give the details of his private and family life. After his father's death, while sharing the kingdom with his brother, he bore his unfriendliness and jealousy most patiently, and, to the wonder of all, could not be provoked to be angry with him. Later he married a daughter of Desiderius, king of the Lombards, at the instance of his mother. But he repudiated her at the end of a year, for some reason unknown, and married Hildegard, a woman of high birth, of Swabian origin. He had three sons by her, Charles, Pepin, and Louis, and as many daughters, Hrudred, Bertha, and Gisela. 
He had three other daughters besides these, Theoderada, Hildrud, and Ruadade, two by his third wife, Fastrada, a woman of East Frankish, that is to say of German origin, and the third by a concubine, whose name for the moment escapes me. At the death of Fastrada, in 794, he married Lutgard, an Alemannic woman, who bore him no children. After her death, June the 4th, 800, he had three concubines, Gerswinda, a Saxon by whom he had Adeltrud, Regina, who was the mother of Drogo and Hugh, and Ethelind, by whom he had Theodoric. Charles's mother, Berthrada, passed her old age with him in great honour. He entertained the greatest veneration for her, and there was never any disagreement between them, except when he divorced the daughter of King Desiderius, whom he had married to please her. She died soon after Hildegard, after living to three grandsons and as many granddaughters in her son's house, and he buried her with great pomp in the Basilica of Saint-Denis, where his father lay. He had an only sister, Gisela, who had consecrated herself to a religious life from girlhood, and he cherished as much affection for her as for his mother. She also died a few years before him in the nunnery where she passed her life. 19. Private life continued, Charles and the education of his children. The plan that he adopted for his children's education was, first of all, to have both boys and girls instructed in the liberal arts, to which he also turned his own attention. As soon as their years admitted, in accordance with the custom of the Franks, the boys had to learn horsemanship, and to practice war and the chase, and the girls to familiarize themselves with cloth-making, and to handle distaff and spindle, so that they might not grow indolent through idleness. And he fostered in them every virtuous sentiment. He only lost three of all his children before his death, two sons and one daughter, Charles, who was the eldest, Pepin, whom he had made king of Italy, and Hrudrud, his oldest daughter, whom he had betrothed to Constantine, the sixth, 780 to 802, emperor of the Greeks. Pepin left one son, named Bernard, and five daughters, Adelaide, Atula, Guntrada, Berthade, and Theodorada. The king gave a striking proof of his fatherly affection at the time of Pepin's death, in 810. He appointed the grandson to succeed Pepin, and had the granddaughters brought up with his own daughters. When his sons and his daughters died, he was not so calm as might have been expected from his remarkably strong mind, for his affections were no less strong, and moved him to tears. Again, when he was told of the death of Hadrian, 796, the Roman pontiff, whom he had loved most of all his friends, he wept as much as if he had lost a brother or a very dear son. He was by nature most ready to contract friendships, and not only made friends easily, but clung to them persistently, and cherished most fondly those with whom he had formed such ties. He was so careful of the training of his sons and daughters that he never took his meals without them when he was at home, and never made a journey without them. His sons would ride at his side, and his daughters follow him, while a number of his bodyguard, detailed for their protection, brought up the rear. Strange to say, although they were very handsome women and he loved them very dearly, he was never willing to marry any of them to a man of their own nation or to a foreigner, but kept them all at home until his death, saying that he could not dispense of their society. Hence, though otherwise happy, he experienced the malignity of fortune as far as they were concerned, yet he concealed his knowledge of the rumours current in regard to them, and of the suspicions entertained of their honour. 20. Conspiracies against Charlemagne By one of his concubines he had a son, handsome in face but hunchbacked, named Pepin, whom I omitted to mention in the list of his children. When Charles was at war with the Huns and was wintering in Bavaria, 792, this Pepin shammed sickness and plotted against his father in company with some of the leading Franks, who seduced him with vain promises of the royal authority. 
when his deceit was discovered and the conspirators were punished, his head was shaved and he was suffered, in accordance with his wishes, to devote himself to a religious life in the monastery of Prum. A formidable conspiracy against Charles had previously been set on foot in Germany, but all the traitors were banished, some of them without mutilation, others after their eyes had been put out. Three of them only lost their lives. They drew their swords and resisted arrest, and after killing several men were cut down because they could not be otherwise overpowered. It is supposed that the cruelty of Queen Fastrada was the primary cause of these plots, and they were both due to Charles's apparent acquiescence in his wife's cruel conduct, and deviation from the usual kindness and gentleness of his disposition. All the rest of his life he was regarded by every one with the utmost love and affection, so much so that not the least accusation of unjust rigour was ever made against him. 21. Charlemagne's treatment of foreigners. He liked foreigners, and was at great pains to take them under his protection. There were often so many of them, both in the palace and the kingdom, that they might reasonably have been considered a nuisance, but he, with his broad humanity, was very little disturbed by such annoyances, because he felt himself compensated for these great inconveniences by the praises of his generosity and the reward of high renown. End of chapter 21。Chapters 22 to 29 of Einhard's Life of Charlemagne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Einhard's Life of Charlemagne. Chapters 22 to 29. CHAPTER Twenty Two: PERSONAL APPEARANCE Charles was large and strong and lofty of stature, though not disproportionately tall. His height is well known to have been seven times the length of his foot. The upper part of his head was round, his eyes very large and animated, nose a little long, hair fine, and face laughing and merry. Thus his appearance was always stately and dignified, whether he was standing or sitting, although his neck was thick and somewhat short, and his belly rather prominent. But the symmetry of the rest of his body concealed these defects. His gait was firm, his whole carriage manly, and his voice clear, but not so strong as his size led one to expect. His health was excellent, except during the four years preceding his death, when he was subject to frequent fevers. At last he even limped a little with one foot. Even in those years he consulted rather his own inclinations than the advice of physicians, who were almost hateful to him, because they wanted him to give up roasts, to which he was accustomed, and to eat boiled meat instead. In accordance with the national custom, he took frequent exercise on horseback and in the chase, accomplishments in which scarcely any people in the world can equal the Franks. He enjoyed the exhalations from natural warm springs, and often practised swimming, in which he was such an adept that none could surpass him. And hence it was that he built his palace at Aix-la-Chapelle, and lived there consistently during his latter years until his death. He used not only to invite his sons to his bath, but his nobles and friends, and now and then a troop of his retinue or bodyguard, so that a hundred or more persons sometimes bathed with him. Chapter 23. Dress. He used to wear the national, that is to say, the frank dress, next his skin a linen shirt and linen breeches, and above these a tunic fringed with silk. While hose fastened by bands covered his lower limbs and shoes his feet, and he protected his shoulders and chest in winter, by a close-fitting coat of otter or martin skins. Over all he flung a blue cloak, and he always had a sort girt about him, usually one with a gold or silver hilt and belt. He sometimes carried a jewelled sword, but only on great feast days, or at the reception of ambassadors from foreign nations. He despised foreign costumes, however handsome, 
and never allowed himself to be robed in them, except twice in Rome, when he donned the Roman tunic, clemis, and shoes, the first time at the request of Pope Hadrian, the second to gratify Leo, Hadrian's successor. On great feast days he made use of embroidered clothes, and shoes bedecked with precious stones. His cloak was fastened by a golden buckle, and he appeared crowned with a diadem of gold and gems. But on other days his dress varied little from the common dress of the people. CHAPTER Twenty Four HABITS Charles was temperate in eating, and particularly so in drinking, for he abominated drunkenness in anybody, much more in himself and those of his household. But he could not easily abstain from food, and often complained that fasts injured his health. He very rarely gave entertainments, only on great feast days, and then to large numbers of people. His meals ordinarily consisted of four courses, not counting the roast, which his huntsmen used to bring in on the spit. He was more fond of this than of any other dish. While at table he listened to reading or music. The subject of the readings were the stories and deeds of olden time. He was fond, too, of St. Augustine's books, and especially of one entitled The City of God. He was so moderate in the use of wine and of all sorts of drink, that he rarely allowed himself more than three cups in the course of a meal. In summer, after the midday meal, he would eat some fruit, drain a single cup, put off his clothes and shoes, just as he did for the night, and rest for two or three hours. He was in the habit of awakening and rising from bed four or five times during the night. While he was dressing and putting on his shoes, he not only gave audience to his friends, but if the count of the palace told him of any suit in which his judgment was necessary, he had the parties brought before him forthwith, took cognizance of the case, and gave his decision, just as if he were sitting on the judgment seat. This is not the only business that he transacted at this time, but he performed any duty of the day whatever, whether he had to attend to the matter himself or to give commands concerning it to his officers. CHAPTER Twenty Five STUDIES Charles had the gift of ready and fluent speech, and could express whatever he had to say with the utmost clearness. He was not satisfied with command of his native language merely, but gave attention to the study of foreign ones, and in particular was such a master of Latin that he could speak it as well as his native tongue but he could understand Greek better than he could speak it. He was so eloquent, indeed, that he might have passed for a teacher of eloquence. He most zealously cultivated the liberal arts, held those who taught them in great esteem, and conferred great honours upon them. He took lessons in grammar of the deacon of Peter of Pisa, at that time an aged man. Another deacon, Albin of Britain, surnamed Alquin, a man of Saxon extraction, who was the greatest scholar of the day, was his teacher in other branches of learning. The king spent much time and labour with him, studying rhetoric, dialectics, and especially astronomy. He learned to reckon, and used to investigate the motions of the heavenly bodies most curiously, with an intelligent scrutiny. He also tried to write, and used to keep tablets and blanks in bed under his pillow that at leisure hours he might accustom his hand to form the letters. However, as he did not begin his efforts in due season, but late in life, they met with ill success. CHAPTER Twenty Six: PIETY He cherished with the greatest fervour and devotion the principles of the Christian religion, which had been installed into him from infancy. Hence it was that he built the beautiful Bascula at Aix-la-Chapelle, which he adorned with gold and silver and lamps, and with rails and doors of solid brass. He had the columns and marbles for this structure brought from Rome and Ravenna, for he could not find such as were suitable elsewhere. He was a constant worshipper at this church as long as his health permitted, going morning and evening, even after nightfall, besides attending mass. And he took care that all the services there conducted should be administered with the utmost possible propriety, very often warning the sextons not to let any improper or unclean thing be brought into the building or remain in it. 
he provided it with a great number of sacred vessels of gold and silver, and with such a quantity of clerical robes, that not even the doorkeepers who fill the humblest office in church were obliged to wear their everyday clothes when in the exercise of their duties. He was at great pains to improve the church reading and psalmody, for he was well skilled in both, although he neither read in public nor sang, except in a low tone and with others. Chapter 27 Generosity Charles and the Roman Church He was very forward in succouring the poor, and in that gratuitous generosity which the Greeks call alms, so much so that he not only made a point of giving in his own country and his own kingdom, but when he discovered that there were Christians living in poverty in Syria, Egypt, and Africa, at Jerusalem, Alexandria, and Carthage, he had compassion on their wants, and used to send money overseas to them. The reason that he zealously strove to make friends with the kings beyond seas was that he might get help and relief to the Christians living under their rule. He cherished the church of St. Peter the Apostle at Rome, above all other holy and sacred places, and heaped its treasury with a vast wealth of gold, silver, and precious stones. He sent great and countless gifts to the popes, and throughout his whole reign, the wish that he had nearest at heart, was to re-establish the ancient authority of the city of Rome, under his care and by his influence, and to defend and protect the church of St. Peter, and to beautifully enrich it with his own store above all other churches. Although he held it in such veneration, he only repaired to Rome to pay his vows, and make his supplications four times during the whole forty-seven years that he reigned. Chapter 28 Charlemagne crowned emperor. When he made his last journey thither, he also had other ends in view. The Romans had inflicted many injuries upon the pontiff Leo, tearing out his eyes and cutting out his tongue, so that he had been complied to call upon the king for help. November twenty fourth, eight hundred. Charles accordingly went to Rome to set in order the affairs of the church which were in great confusion, and passed the whole winter there. It was then that he received the titles of Emperor and Augustus, December twenty fifth, 800, to which he had first had such an aversion, that he declared that he would not have set foot in the church the day that they were conferred. Although it was a great feast day, if he could have foreseen the design of the Pope, he bore very patiently with the jealousy which the Roman emperor showed upon his assuming these titles, for they took this step very ill. And by dint of frequent embassies and letters, in which he addressed them as brothers, he made their haughtiness yield to his magnanimity, a quality in which he was unquestionably much their superior. Chapter 29. Reforms It was after he had received the imperial name, that, finding the laws of his people very defective, the Franks have two sets of laws, very different in many particulars, he determined to add what was wanting, to reconcile the discrepancies, and to correct what was vicious and wrongly cited in them. However, he went no further in this matter than to supplement the laws by a few capitularies, and those imperfect ones. But he caused the unwritten laws of all the tribes that came under his rule to be compiled and reduced to writing. He also had the old rude songs that selate the deeds and wars of the ancient kings written out for transmission to posterity. He began a grammar of his native language. He gave the months names in his own tongue, in place of the Latin and barbarous names by which they were formerly known among the Franks. He likewise designated the winds by twelve appropriate names. There were hardly more than four distinctive ones in use before. He called January winter month, February Hornung, March Letzenmarneth, April Ostermarneth, May Winnemarneth, June Brachmarneth, July Hoivumarneth, August Aranmarneth, September Whitonmarneth, October Windoimarneth, November Herbistmarneth. December, Heilagmanath. He styled the winds as follows. Subsolanus, Ostroni wind, 
Eroes, Ostrundroni. Ero Auster, Sundustroni. Auster, Sundroni. Austro Africus, Sundwestroni. Africus, West Sundroni. Zephyrus, Westroni. Caurus, West Nordroni. Circius, Nordwestroni. Septentrio, Nordroni. Aquilo, Nordostroni. Voltumus, Osnodroni. End of chapter 4. Chapters 30 to 33 of Einhard's Life of Charlemagne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Einhard's Life of Charlemagne. Chapters 30 to 33. 30. Coronation of Louis. Charlemagne's Death. Toward the close of his life, 813, when he was broken by ill health and old age, he summoned Louis, king of Aquitania, his only surviving son by Hildegard, and gathered together all the chief men of the whole kingdom of the Franks in a solemn assembly. He appointed Louis, with their unanimous consent, to rule with himself over the whole kingdom, and constituted him heir to the imperial name. Then, placing the diadem upon his son's head, he bade him be proclaimed emperor, and his step was hailed by all present favor, for it really seemed as if God had prompted him to it for the kingdom's good. It increased the king's dignity, and struck no little terror into the foreign nations. After sending his son back to Aquitania, although weak from age, he set out to hunt, as usual, near his palace at Aix-la-Chapelle, and passed the rest of the autumn in the chase, returning thither about the 1st of November, 813. While wintering there, he was seized in the month of January with a high fever, January 22, 814, and took to his bed. As soon as he was taken sick, he prescribed for himself abstinence from food, as he had always used to do in case of fever, thinking that the disease could be driven off, or at least mitigated by fasting. Besides the fever, he suffered from a pain in his side, which the Greeks called pleurisy, but he still persisted in fasting and in keeping up his strength only by draughts taken at very long intervals. He died January 28th, the seventh day from the time that he took to his bed, at nine o'clock in the morning, after partaking of the Holy Communion, in the seventy-second year of his age, and forty-seventh of his reign. January 28th, 814. 31. Burial. His body was washed and cared for in the usual manner, and was then carried to the church, and interred amid the greatest lamentations of all the people. There was some question at first where to lay him, because in his lifetime he had given no directions as to his burial, but at length all agreed that he could nowhere be more honorably entombed than at the very basilica that he had built in the town at his own expense, for love of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, and in honor of the holy and eternal virgin, his mother. He was buried there the same day that he died and a gilded arch was erected above his tomb, with his image and an inscription. The words of the inscription were as follows. In this tomb lies the body of Charles, the great and orthodox emperor, who gloriously extended the kingdom of the Franks, and reigned prosperously for forty-seven years. He died at the age of seventy, in the year of our Lord, 814, the seventh indiction, on the twenty-eighth day of January. 32 omens of death. Very many omens had pretended his approaching end, a fact that he had recognized as well as others. Eclipses both of the sun and moon were very frequent during the last three years of his life, and a black spot was visible on the sun for a space of seven days. The gallery between the basilica and the palace, which he had built at great pains and labor, fell in sudden ruin to the ground on the day of the ascension of our Lord. The wooden bridge over the Rhine at Mayence which he had caused to be constructed with admirable skill, at the cost of ten years' hard work, so that it seemed as if it might last forever, was so completely consumed in three hours by an accidental fire, that not a single splinter of it was left, except what was under water. Moreover, one day in his last campaign into Saxony, 
against Godfred, king of the Danes, Charles himself saw a ball of fire fall suddenly from the heavens with a great light, just as he was leaving camp before sunrise to set out on the march. It rushed across the clear sky from right to left, and everybody was wondering what was the meaning of the sign, when the horse that he was riding gave a sudden plunge, head foremost, and fell and threw him to the ground so heavily that his cloak buckle was broken and his sword belt shattered, and after his servants had hastened to him and relieved him of his arms, he could not rise without their assistance. He happened to have a javelin in his hand when he was thrown, and this was struck from his grasp with such force that it was found lying at a distance of twenty-four feet or more from the spot. Again, the palace at Aix-la-Chapelle frequently trembled. The roofs of whatever buildings he tarried in kept up a continual crackling noise. The basilica in which he was afterwards buried was struck by lightning, and the gilded hall that adorned the pinnacle of the roof was shattered by the thunderbolt and hurled upon the bishop's house adjoining. In this same basilica, on the margin of the cornice that ran around the interior, between the upper and lower tiers of arches, a legend was inscribed in red letters, stating who was the builder of the temple, the last words of which were Carolus Princeps. The year that he died, it was remarked by some, a few months before his decease, that the letters of the word Princeps was so effaced as to no longer be decipherable. But Charles despised, or affected to despise, all these omens, as having no reference whatsoever to him. 33. Will. It had been his intention to make a will, that he might give some share in the inheritance to his daughters, and the children of his concubines, but it was begun too late, and could not be finished. Three years before his death, however, he made a division of his treasures, money, clothes, and other movable goods, in the presence of his friends and servants, and called them to witness it, that their voices might ensure the gratification of the disposition thus made. He had a summary drawn up of his wishes regarding this distribution of his property, the terms and the text of which are as follows. In the name of the Lord God, the Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, this is the inventory and division dictated by the most glorious and most pious Lord Charles, Emperor Augustus, in the 811th year of the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the 43rd year of his reign in France, and thirty-seven in Italy, the eleventh of his empire, and the fourth indiction, which considerations of piety and prudence have determined him, and the favor of God enabled him, to make of his treasures and money a certain this day to be in his treasure chamber. In this division he is especially desirous to provide not only that the largesse of alms, which Christians usually make of their possessions, shall be made for himself in due course and order out of his wealth, but also that his heirs shall be free from all doubt, and know clearly what belongs to them, and be able to share their property by suitable partition without litigation or strife. With this intention, and to this end, he has first divided all his substance and movable goods ascertained to be in his treasure chamber, on the day aforesaid, in gold, silver, precious stones, and royal ornaments, into three lots, and has subdivided and set off two of the said lots into twenty-one parts, keeping the third entire. The first two lots have been thus subdivided into twenty-one parts, because there are in his kingdom twenty-one recognized metropolitan cities, and in order that each archbishopric might receive by way of alms at the hands of his heirs and friends one of the said parts, and that the archbishop who shall then administer his affairs shall take the part given to it, and share the same with his suffragans in such manner that one-third shall go to the church, and the remaining two-thirds shall be divided among the suffragans. The twenty-one parts, into which the first two lots are to be distributed, according to the number of recognized metropolitan cities, have been set apart one from another, and each has been put aside by itself in a box labeled with the name of the city for which it is destined. The names of the cities to which this alms, or largesse, is to be sent are as follows. Rome, Ravenna, Milan, Friuli, Grado, Cologne, Mayence, Salzburg, Treves, Sens, Besançon, Lyon, Rouen, Reims, Arles, Vienne, Moutier in Tarentes, Embrun, Bordeaux, Tours, and Bourges. 
the third lot, which he wishes to be kept entire, is to be stowed as follows. While the first two lots are to be divided into the parts aforesaid, and set aside under seal, the third lot shall be employed for the owner's daily needs, as property which he shall be under no obligation to part with, in order to the fulfillment of any vow, and this as long as he shall be in the flesh, or consider it necessary for his use. But upon his death, or voluntary renunciation of the affairs of this world, this said lot shall be divided into four parts, and one thereof should be added to the aforesaid twenty-one parts. The second shall be assigned to his sons and daughters, and to the sons and daughters of his sons, to be distributed among them in just and equal partition. The third, in accordance with the custom common among Christians, shall be devoted to the poor, and the fourth shall go to the support of the men servants and maid servants on duty in the palace. It is his wish that, to this said third lot of the whole amount, which consists, as well as the rest, of gold and silver, shall be added all the vessels and utensils of brass iron and other metals together with the arms, clothing, and other movable goods, costly and cheap, adapted to diverse uses, as hangings, coverlets, carpets, woolen stuffs, leathern articles, pack saddles, and whatsoever shall be found in his treasure chamber and wardrobe at the time, in order that thus the parts of said lot may be augmented, and the alms distributed reach more persons. He ordains that his chapel, that is to say, its church property, as well that which he has provided and collected, as that which came to him by inheritance from his father, shall remain entire, and not be dissevered by any partition whatever. If, however, any vessels, books, or other articles be found therein, which are certainly known not to have been given by him to the said chapel, whoever wants them shall have them on paying their value at a fair estimation. He likewise commands that the books which he has collected in his library in great numbers shall be sold for fair prices to such as want them, and the money received therefrom given to the poor. It is well known that among his other property and treasures there are three silver tables, one very large and massive golden one. He directs and commands that the square silver table, upon which there is a representation of the city of Constantinople, shall be sent to the Basilica of St. Peter the Apostle at Rome, which the other gifts destined therefore, that the round one, adorned with a delineation of the city of Rome, shall be given to the Episcopal Church at Ravenna, that the third, which far surpasses the other two in weight and beauty of workmanship, is made in three circles, showing the plan of the whole universe, drawn with skill and delicacy, shall go, together with the golden table, fourthly mentioned, to increase the lot which is to be devoted to his heirs and to alms. This deed, and the dispositions thereof, he has made and appointed in the presence of bishops and abbots and counts able to be present, whose names are hereto subscribed. Bishops, Hildebald, Rickoff, Arnold, Warfar, Bernon, Laidrod, John, Theodolf, Jesse, Haitu, Valtgald, Abbots, Fredugi, Adelung, Englebert, Imero, Counts, Wallico, Meganer, Atulf, Stephen, Unoruk, Burkhard, Meganhard, Hatu, Rewin, Ido, Ergenkar, Gerald, Barrow, Hildegard, Rakoff. Charles's son, Louis, who, by the grace of God, succeeded him, after examining this summary, took pains to fulfill all its conditions most religiously as soon as possible after his father's death. End of chapter 30 through 33 and End of Einhard's Life of Charlemagne